Canon has announced the new 1DX Mark II, the follow-up to their hugely successful pro-level photojournalism and sports camera. This thing is a beast, but it might just be the world's most capable camera. Is it right for you? Let's dig into the details of it. Canon is leading with its 4K capabilities, which really are pretty remarkable. We recently reviewed the new Nikon D5, which is Nikon's competitor to this camera, and we were really disappointed with those 4K capabilities, but Canon really kicked butt with this. Full 4K at up to 60 frames a second. It's also the like wide format 4K at, at 4096 pixels rather than the shorter like 3840 pixels that we see on YouTube. Uh, that means you actually have some extra pixels on the side that you'll be cropping if you'd be using it for a YouTube or other 16 by 9 format. At 1080p, if that's what you're shooting, you can shoot at up to 120 frames a second. That gives you 4x slow-mo if you're publishing in 30 frames a second or 5x slow-mo if you're publishing at 24 frames a second. And that's, that's super smooth and looks really good. I also just like to publish in 60 frames a second on, on YouTube. Well, we don't do it very often, but you get this like nice smooth quality when you do publish at, 50, at 60 frames a second. It's just like much more realistic. Just do yourself a favor, look up 60p videos on YouTube. If you do end up shooting at that 120p for slow-mo, there's, there's some restrictions for it. It's not a normal video mode, so it's, it's limited to like seven and a half minutes of video. But that, that's not too bad. That's, that's capable, especially for the types of things you'd be using for slow-mo anyway. This camera also has dual pixel AF, and that's, that's a feature that we reviewed in the Canon 70D, which has been around a while, uh, and it, it was always just awesome. We don't use the 70D to film anymore because it's not 4K but we always loved the dual pixel AF, which allowed us to just touch the screen to refocus it, and it would be nice and smooth and very accurate. And even to this day, we haven't found anything that really tracked faces as well as that old 70D did. That means you can do things like tracking shots where somebody walks towards the camera and it will do a pretty good job of keeping it in focus. Canon has made a lot of improvements to the dual pixel AF, and they've added a lot of adjustability to it. So we're excited to see exactly how well those will work. That adjustability is going to be really important for filmmakers who might want the focus to snap into action, or they might want to simply hold focus, or they might want this focus to be nice and smooth. So you'll have complete control over those different parameters by just going into the menu system. Uh, anyway, it looks like it's going to be a really remarkable video camera, um, largely because it also has a touchscreen. And thank you, Canon, for adding a touchscreen to the top end camera. The Nikon did that for their D5 as well. And, you know, I, I've been begging camera makers to put touchscreens on every camera for, for years now. And one of the arguments I heard from critics was that pros don't want touchscreens. But Nikon and Canon both put touchscreens on their top end cameras because it's, it's just practical. And that's what pros really care about is a quick workflow and getting things done. And touchscreens allow you to do that. For the sake of video, the ability to touch to focus means you don't have to shake the camera around, you don't have to change focusing points. It all works very smoothly, easily, and accurately. Um, this touch screen, well, it's, it's not a full touch screen capability. You can't go and navigate menus and stuff, uh, but that was never my favorite feature. Just the ability to kind of uh, touch to focus and, and also like zoom in and, and replay pictures are the things I find most useful about it. And yes, if you are one of those people who says touchscreens, I hate them, blah, 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 you can just turn it off. <laughs> so don't sweat it. The video has some severe limitations when you're recording in 4K, though. It has a serious crop factor. And this is something that we've seen from a lot of different camera manufacturers. That there's a challenge with reading the entire sensor and outputting a 4K video. So 4K itself is, is around 8 megapixels, and we're looking at a full 20 megapixel sensor. Video we normally see is, is cropped to 16 by 9, which is shorter. It's wider and shorter than the, the standard 35 millimeter picture format. So we're used to having the top and bottoms of our photos cropped off if we're displaying, a, if we're using a, a film camera, a stills camera for video. Um, but for 4K, they're, they're taking one pixel at a time rather than taking the whole sensor and kind of smushing it down. They're taking the 4K center of it. So when you're recording at that 4096 wide format, that means you'll have about a 1.3x crop factor from full frame. And this is a big deal because that's pretty close to a Super 35 or APS-C size sensor. 
And those 4K cameras, you can get much less expensively. They don't have all these features, but the whole point of using these 4K sensors for video is that you can get that sort of beautiful background blur. That's what we love about using our uh, Sony A7s. They're full frame cameras capable of doing 4K and they, and they just take full advantage of the wide variety of full frame lenses out there. And that's an amazing opportunity for filmmakers. And you're gonna miss out on that with the 1DX. You're gonna to have to multiply both the focal length and the f-stop by the crop factor you see here if you wanna understand the results that you'll be getting with them. You just won't be taking full advantage of it. And that's at 4096 wide. If you're publishing to a 16 by nine format, like almost everything except actual movie projectors, you're gonna be using a 1.43x crop factor. That's really heavy. Again, this, is, this means it's about as capable as an APS-C camera. Uh, the end results with a given lens wouldn't look much different than those you'd get out of uh, the new Sony A6300, which only costs $1,000. So we're disappointed that there is a crop factor on the 4K video. It's actually mathematically really difficult to take the full sensor and crunch it down, and that can make a camera overheat. <laughs> we saw this in the first firmware revision of the Sony A7R2. The A7R2 will shoot 4K video either cropped like this or by using the full sensor readout. And it, we, we use that camera all the time. And we love the ability to shoot full frame and get the background blur, or we love the ability to crop down and get a little more reach out of our lenses. And that's not something I'd really be willing to give up, even to make the jump to 60 frames a second, even for the sort of uh, touchscreen autofocus. There are lots of benefits, but I, it's, it's hard to overcome that full frame capability. And it's something that's lacking in the 1DX. And I want to make the point that the 1DX Mark II is not a camcorder, it's still a DSLR, and lots of serious filmmakers use different types of DSLRs or mirrorless cameras, mirrorless still cameras for video. But if you are gonna do that and you're thinking about dropping six grand on a camera, you might look at the wide variety of 4K video cameras that are available with similar size sensors, like the Blackmagic Ursa Mini, the Sony FS7. There, there's all these 4K video cameras that are out there that are purpose-built have things like great viewfinders and just generally create a, a better workflow. And that can make a huge difference in the final products. Something to consider. Now the sensor in this camera is 20 megapixels and that can be shocking because if you follow new camera releases, one of the things camera makers do is they just release higher and higher megapixels. In fact, even the, the base model camera from Canon, the T6i right now is 24 megapixels. So why is their $6,000 camera only 20 megapixels? Well, first, it, it is a serious compromise. You will find people out there saying, well, because fewer megapixels mean less noise. We haven't found that to be the case. You can search our channel for a video on pixel density, and you'll see that that's not, there's not necessarily a correlation there. The real reason that it's only 20 megapixels is for speed. Because if you have a 5DSR like we do, it's 50 megapixels. And that's a ton of data to be moving off of the chip, processing, and then pushing it into the memory, and that slows everything down. So these are gonna, it's only 20 megapixels, but they're a beautiful 20 megapixels. I do wanna address one point. Canon, Canon does this math, which I recently addressed in a video, where they take that 20 megapixels, they convert it to 300 DPI, and they say you can get a, a 12 by six by 18 inch print out of it at 300 DPI. Briefly, 300 DPI is the number at which you, you can hold, the average human can hold a picture printed at 300 DPI as close as their vision can see unassisted and everything will look super sharp. And this, this math just doesn't hold up in the real world. This would work if you were to use an optically perfect lens. So if you happen to be using the Zeiss Otis, a $6,000 lens on its own, manually focused, and you nailed the focus, and you were using the sweet spot, and everything else worked out just perfectly, then yes, you would get an actual 300 DPI, and you would get crystal clear images. But any other lens is going to be less than optically perfect, including those Sanin, the Canon L lenses that you probably are using. They're not optically perfect. They're great. They're just not optically perfect which means you won't be getting that full 20 megapixels of detail. You might see more like 12 to 15 megapixels of detail. So you would be able to see some level of unsharpness at 300 DPI. It might be enough for you. They did this math where they dropped it down to 200 DPI. 200 DPI often makes great looking images. We print at 200 DPI all the time and it's fine, but that would get you up to 20 by 30 inch print. 
Anyway, for detailed information, visit sdp.io slash mp. If you are concerned about image details, if you are making huge prints, or if you are cropping heavily, it's an important consideration. The image quality on the 1DX has always been uh, about 20% better than the other cameras like the 5D Mark III that were released at the same time. Because it's the top end camera, they just pull out all the stops and they, they give you images that are just as clean as they can possibly get. So it does tend to have less noise than other Canon cameras. Canon tends to have more noise than Sony and Nikon, however. So I expect the 1DX Mark II to have cleaner images than we see out of either the 5D Mark III, the existing 1DX, or the 5DSR. How much better? I don't know. The 1DX was about 20% better than the 5D Mark III, which was released at about the same time. So maybe we'll see it be 20% cleaner than the 5DSR. Frame rate is maybe the most important factor for the 1DX and the Nikon D5. This camera is unbelievably fast. It's the fastest full frame camera that I know of, uh, at least the DSLR, with 14 frames a second when you're looking through the viewfinder. 14 frames a second, that's unbelievably fast. You can lock that mirror up and use live view on the back and it will be 16 frames a second. What this means to sports and wildlife photographers is that the odds of your catching that perfect moment go up. If you're using a Canon 5DSR, which only has five frames a second, uh, and, and you jump up to 16 frames a second here, you're gonna be capturing three times as many pictures. And if you're shooting a baseball player who's taking a swing at a ball, you want that moment when the ball contacts the bat. That's perfect, but you can't time it. You just, you can't plan to push the shutter button at that instant. You just have to kind of what they call spray and pray. You have to hold it down, shoot continuously and hope you catch it. If you're a wildlife photographer, you, the perfect moment might be the moment when the bird's wings are fully extended rather than in some sort of flapping state. But again, you don't get to time that. You can hold the button down and let the camera do the work. Anyway, faster frame rates result in better pictures for those of us who shoot action. So even the jump from 12 frames a second in the previous camera to 14 frames a second in this camera when using the viewfinder is significant. If it means you get an extra 15 to 20% more pictures, lots of pros will want to upgrade just for that. This camera will capture 170 raw photos consecutively. It doesn't quite match the Nikon D5, but then again, the Nikon D5 has a slightly slower frame rate, so it's not capturing them quite as quickly. Either way, this is a huge raw burst number, and that's only when you're using the new CFast uh, memory card. So it'll come with a very fast memory card that you can use. It has 100% viewfinder coverage, uh, which basically means you can see corner to corner when you're using the viewfinder. It's, it's something we kind of take for granted. Some other cameras can be like 97%, and so you might, you are basically seeing a tiny bit of crop in your images. I never found that to be that big of a deal. Of course, the live view or any EVF is always 100% viewfinder coverage. They're also including a new battery with it, which just has more capacity. And they've, they've done something really thoughtful, especially for, for working pros who have the existing system. You can take this new LPE19 battery and uh, stick it in your existing 1DX. And you can take your 1DX batteries and stick it in this system. So you don't have to throw out your existing batteries. You can continue to use them, but you will get more capacity when you use it bunch of connectors on the side, all the usual stuff, no surprises here. They, they have USB 3, which makes tethering much faster. Um, they have a, a network jack, an ethernet jack here, which uh, is, is something only these top end cameras have, but I actually much prefer it over tethering, both because it's very fast when you wanna transfer pictures to a computer in real time, but also because ethernet cables are, are nice and flexible, whereas USB 3 cables are like fat and kind of rigid, unless you get one of those new Corning optical cables. Anyway, it's, it's nice to have that, that network jack on there. And of course, there's a headphone and mic jack for those who are recording video and want to be able to monitor the sound. Lots and lots of focusing points that do a pretty good job of spreading it throughout the frame. You'll find that the, the coverage here is almost the same as on the D5, and we'll cover that in a little bit. 61 full AF points, and um, it focuses down at the, with a the center focusing point only, all the way down to EV minus three. EV is this uh, system of measuring how bright or dark it is. And EV minus three, well, that's just like real dark. It's hard to put that in precise terms, but you, you would definitely have no problem autofocusing in, in any sort of a suburban neighborhood with a few streetlights nearby. You could also autofocus in moonlight pretty well. Some other cameras go a little bit lower, but EV minus three, it's generally plenty. 
They've also greatly expanded F8 autofocus, allowing you to use, say, a 2x teleconverter and maybe the 500 or 600 f4 lens and autofocus with all the focusing points. That that is so useful, especially to wildlife photographers who want to get a whole bunch of reach. So. As a wildlife photographer, you, you end up cropping a lot. And usually you just want as many megapixels as you can because you can't get close enough and you end up cropping. You, people will use teleconverters, but teleconverters are not free. They cut down the amount of light. So if you put a 1.4x teleconverter on an f5.6 lens, suddenly the lens is functioning more like an f8 lens and gathering the same amount of light per square inch as an f8 lens. And your camera won't be able to autofocus or you can try to trick it and it won't be able to autofocus well. But one of the things that 1DX cameras do, and, and the D5 cameras to a lesser extent, is focus amazingly at F8. So you don't even know that you have that teleconverter on. Anyway, as a wildlife photographer, rather than just compensating with more megapixels and then cropping, you can just use a bigger teleconverter and actually get yourself closer and see a better view through the viewfinder as well. Anyway, the ability to F8 autofocus on all those focusing points is really useful. Some other cameras in the Canon lineup will F8 autofocus, um, but maybe it's only the center autofocusing point, something like the 7D Mark II or the, the 5DSR. It's including GPS as well. And uh, I, I love having GPS, especially if you're a landscape photographer or a wildlife photographer. It means you can go back and pull up Lightroom and go to the Maps tab and actually see where all your pictures were taken. It's fantastic for travel too. But especially for landscape and wildlife photographers, you often want to return to the same spot. You never have to worry about keeping track of it. Anyway, I wish every camera had GPS. It's not that expensive to build in, so it does have all that logging in there. It also has a, a 1.6 megapixel display on the back, which is just, it's like 60% sharper than they typically put in, ca in camera. So that means you'll actually be able to see more detail, assuming you have <laughs> pretty good vision. You know, I want to back up on the F8 autofocus point. I want to make a point that the middle 16 autofocus points are all cross-type, even at F8. If you can't tell, I'm kind of pumped about the F8 autofocus. The ability to use a teleconverter and actually be able to get sharp images and moving subjects, that's fantastic. One of the hallmarks of both the 1DX Mark II and the Nikon D5 is the drip-proofing drip and the durability. Uh, these, this is something the average person doesn't need at all. But professional photographers who simply have to go out on the rainy day <laughs> find to be really important. And, and they're not submersible. Um, but they will get you through a drizzly day. If you're shooting a football game and it starts raining, you don't have to run inside. In fact, you probably don't have to run inside with any camera because most cameras can handle some droplets and stuff without getting wrecked. But each of the buttons and dials are completely weatherproofed. I see this as a huge compromise. I never especially liked the buttons and dials on the D5 and the 1DX because they aren't designed for ergonomics so much as weatherproofing. So you can give it a good spray. It's going to survive better than just about any other interchangeable lens camera out there. But you do give up a little bit on the ergonomics. It's also built like a tank. And when you pick one of these things up, they are hard, strong, and heavy. And uh, just look up some, some sideline photographer videos. You'll see that sometimes you're going to be shooting on the sidelines and the football player will just run into you. Other times, maybe you're just in a hurry and you will literally just throw the camera in the back of your car or it will fall off a tripod or something. You spend six grand on a camera, you want to hope that it's going to be able to survive being banged around a little bit. And these cameras are designed to do that. They are extremely tough. That also means they're big and heavy, and that's a compromise. It's a compromise. These car cameras have two memory cards, of course, as any professional camera should. They come equipped with one CF card and one CFast card. CFast is just basically an updated version of the CF card standards that requires new memory cards, but also allows you to write much faster. So things like that 16 frames a second, 4K at 60p, those require you to use a new CFast card. So you might have to invest in, in some new memory cards, but you can still put your old cards in the CF card slot. A couple other less minor points that I don't think are that important. They've upped the maximum ISO to ISO 51200 can't take that as an indicator of overall like one stop better image quality or two stops better image quality. The upper ISO limit is it's just a software, an arbitrary software thing because higher ISOs are just basically mostly just gain, artificial gain, just cranking up the amplifier to 11. They can make the top limit to 5 million <laughs> if they wanted to and you just end up with really noisy images. They of course can be extended further. It's more of a convenience. It's not really a point I think should be marketed. 
They also updated the metering system, and, and they, th those effects do look impressive. The updated metering system can do things like find a face and better expose around the face so your subject is better illuminated. When we've, we've upgraded metering systems in the past, for example, from the, the D800 to the D810, and we did find it actually made better choices, but we'll wait until we actually test it. Again, this camera is going to cost 6 k and if you want to pick it up, you can pre-order it at scp.io slash 1DX2. We appreciate you using those links. We get a few pennies out of every dollar. It should be available around the end of April, though sometimes those dates get pushed back. So what's not to like? It's the top-end camera. Is it simply the best camera in the world if you have unlimited amounts of money, if money is no object? Is that what you should get? Probably not. Um, first, this camera is massive. This is from CameraSize.com, and you can see it, it dwarfs even the, the quite large 5DSR in the middle there. And on the, on the far right here, we have the A7R2, which is also a full-frame camera. Same sensor size, same bokeh, probably maybe even better image quality, but in a much smaller form factor. And you will notice that size difference. I am not somebody who loves big cameras. I also don't care about the vertical grip. I'm just not somebody who really enjoys using a vertical grip. For filmmakers, the vertical grip is completely useless. But even if you're just walking around doing travel photography, if you strap a 1DX to your body, I find that vertical grip is kind of like banging into my side as I'm walking with a strap. It means the camera won't easily fit in a lot of bags. You can't easily slip it in a messenger bag because it's just so tall. So I, I consider that bigger size a real hindrance. Other people absolutely love it. It's a matter of taste. Also, of course, those low megapixels mean you simply will not capture as much detail as you would on a 36 megapixel Nikon D810 or a 50 megapixel 5DSR. You will just have less detail, which means if you want to make huge prints or something, you won't see it that much. Designed for photojournalists, sports photographers who, who want to quickly get their images to a live news feed or to their editor. And because those images aren't typically printed bigger than full page in a magazine, they actually don't need huge amounts of megapixels. It's usually just fine, but it is kind of purpose-built. If you want to make massive prints, as we often do, you'll just simply get better images by choosing a less expensive 5DSR. It just also doesn't include Wi-Fi built in. Now, we'll talk a little bit about how Nikon has a, well, here we go. They've released an updated version of adapter that attaches to uh, 802.11ac networks, and there's a great deal of software integrated that allows you to quickly get pictures that you snap off to an editor, and they seem to have done a really good job with it, but it's not integrated. You have to spend an extra, another 600 bucks on an external adapter, and then you have this kind of kludgy thing on the outside that makes the whole thing just a little bit harder to handle. I wish they could have built it in. They, they didn't, or they couldn't, or something. I also say it doesn't have an electronic viewfinder, which is an advantage of mirrorless cameras. Um, but especially as this relates to being used for video, it means you can only preview the video on the back screen. And if you're out in the sun, it's, it can often be just impossible to see. It can also make it really difficult to focus without an EVF. The EVF blocks out all light, makes composition easier, and uh, accurately previews your exposure so you don't have to shoot and then chimp to see if your exposure is right. You know your exposure is right before you take the picture. I would love to see a DSLR with an electronic viewfinder. It's possible. <laughs> Let's make it happen. Let's quickly compare the 1DX to Nikon's main competitor, the D5. Um, I'm a little shocked by the price because as, as we'll see, the 1DX Mark II is beating the D5 in almost every way, but the D5 is currently priced $500 more. Now, both of these are fair prices, and Nikon announced the D5 at the $6,500 price point before Canon. In fact, it kind of feels like Canon rushed out the announcement of the 1DX to, to follow the D5 because the D5 was new and great, um, but shockingly, Canon undercut the price, and they're offering way more. I think we're going to see Nikon drop the price on the D5 to match this. They just have to. They have to come in at a lower price point because the 1DX Mark II is faster, substantially faster, 14 frames a second using the viewfinder instead of 12. The burst rate isn't quite the same, but as I said, the, the Nikon shoots a little bit slower, which will give it a longer extension. The AF points. I consider that to be basically a draw. <coughs> the Nikon um, adds in more AF points, but they're not all selectable. And will we actually see any difference? Well, we'll just have to test it to find out. The 1DX Mark II has F8 autofocus at all, 61 autofocus points, whereas the D5 will only F8 autofocus at 15 autofocus points. So if you're a wildlife photographer, you're definitely going to appreciate that. 
and the D5 will center on the center autofocus point all the way down to EV minus 4. So it'll focus in even darker environments, which might be important to you. As a video camera, the 1DX Mark II completely eats the lunch of the D5, going all the way to 60 frames a second at 4K, but more importantly, recording a full 30 minutes in 4K, whereas the D5 is limited to 3 minutes. It depends on the type of video you're shooting. Maybe 3 minutes is all you need, but in most actual production scenarios, it takes a minute after recording just to kind of get all the actors ready and everything. You know how they say lights, camera, action? You're going to be recording at the camera, but stuff doesn't start until the action. And it's not always that immediate. It's easy to burn through three minutes of recording time. The D5 has a 1.5x crop when recording 4K, whereas the 1DX Mark II has a lesser crop, 1.3 to 1.4x. And the 1DX Mark II has that awesome dual phase AF whereas the Nikon D5 lacks that. Another big question is how is the image quality going to compare? Nikon cameras t tend to have cleaner images than the Canon cameras. We'll test it as soon as we can get our hands on one. Let's look at the autofocus points and how they're spread about the frame. This is the 1DX. And as I switch over to the D5 here, you can see they have about the same coverage. The 1DX brags that it goes a little bit higher and lower, but it's not that big of a difference. By comparison, the 70 Mark II is an APS-C camera, but actually has much more spread across the entire frame. The same would apply to the D500. So if you don't mind using the smaller sensor, the 70 Mark II or the D500 will give you much more coverage on those AF points, allowing you more flexible compositions without having to use focus and recompose. Let's quickly compare the 1DX Mark II to its predecessor, the original 1DX. The 1DX is available new for about $4,500 or $3,000 used. It's actually less expensive than a 5DSR. It's as fast as a D5, but less, not as fast as the 1DX Mark II, and it only focuses down to EV minus 2. Most of the differences are going to be in the video front, so if you are a stills photographer, seriously consider picking up a used 1DX. These things are built like tanks, and the used models will continue to run for a long, long time, so you can save yourself, well, half, $3,000, which you could then put into some lenses, or a trip to Yosemite, or something those things will actually make a huge difference in your pictures, whereas the jump from 12 to 14 frames a second might not be that big of a difference. But if you're going to be shooting video, the 1DX Mark II is a vastly better camera than the original 1DX. You might also want to look at the 1DC, Canon's more dedicated video camera. Let's compare the 1DX Mark II to the 5DSR, which is now one step down from this big boy, and not that far away in price, $3,900. You can see the 5DSR is substantially smaller, that's why it's kind of my preference. It's much easier to travel with. It's much lighter to carry around. It also has a much bigger sensor at 50 megapixels. So depending on if your style, if you're not, if you don't need more than five frames a second, the 5 DSRs 50 megapixels will produce better images, but those are also slower to work on. In fact, sometimes we pick up lower megapixel cameras just because it gets so annoying to load in 50 megapixel pictures and have to sort through them. But when you actually care about the results, when you need to make huge prints, it's nice to know you're getting as much detail as possible. The 1DX Mark II records 4K, whereas the 5DSR is a 1080p camera only. The 1DX Mark II has much better video autofocusing, whereas the 5DSR has lousy contrast-based autofocusing, which means it can autofocus when recording video, but it gets all jerky. You wouldn't ever want to autofocus during the recording. It would ruin that video clip for you. They're both solid cameras, but the 1DX Mark II is simply built like a tank. If you're considering video and you are don't mind shooting in a DSLR form factor, check out the A7S Mark II, which records 4K internally for only 3K. Again, half the price, leaving bunches of money for lenses and such, and you can attach Canon lenses to an A7S Mark II just using the right adapter. The A7S Mark II only records at 30 frames a second, but it has S-Log3, which allows you to capture more dynamic range allows you to capture the detail in the bright skies and clouds, as well as uh, making the subject matter's face, which might be in shadow, look much better. Without that sort of thing, I have a hard time uh, taking the 1DX Mark II serious as a, as a versatile camera for filmmaking. The 1DX Mark II, will, however, will have much better video AF. And I can say that without having done hands-on tests, because I have tested the Canon 70D, and I've tested the A7S II. The A7S II's autofocus is terrible. You just, you, you're going to just manually focus all the time, which is fine. That's just what we do. We use it all the time. We just manually focus. But it would be nice to have nice, smooth video autofocusing. A7S Mark II also has lots of usability features, things like focus peaking. Um, it has a tilt screen. 
because you often shoot video on a tripod, you might be shooting low to the ground or high up in the air. Being able to tilt that screen really helps. The 1DX Mark II does not have a tilt screen. It's fixed. And in fact, you can't use the EVF. So if you want to change the angle, you have to hook up an external recorder like an Atomos or something. So you can just tilt it or step away from the camera or be at a different angle. However, because it's a touchscreen, you can take advantage of that AF. So um, the electronic viewfinder allows you to hold up the A7S Mark II to your eye, blocking out all sunlight, allowing you to see the screen and be more discreet while you're recording. Big advantage in sunlight. And it also has uses the full frame to record video. And that's, that's a huge advantage for people who are taking artistic style shots, allows you to get better background blur and use your full frame lenses in the way that they were intended. For those who might shoot handheld, the A7S Mark II has in-body image stabilization, what Sony calls steady shot inside, that will act as an image stabilizer even if you have a lens that doesn't have image stabilization. That's incredibly useful because you could put, say, an 85 millimeter f1.4, a prime lens which doesn't have image stabilization, and have it stabilized. So you can kind of get the best of both worlds. And for low light work, stills or video, it's incredibly useful. Let's talk about some of the things we're disappointed in. So many exciting things in the 1DX Mark II. We always wish for a few more things. I just want to kind of voice what those things are. As I mentioned before, there's no Wi-Fi built in. And if you want it, you got to spend an extra 600 bucks. That's a bummer. I, I always remind camera makers that I want to see native ISOs, not extended ISOs, but native ISOs below 100. The D810 right now offers ISO 64. We use it all the time. Let me shoot at ISO 50. Let me shoot at ISO 25. This is useful not only for long exposures, but for eliminating noise in studio conditions when you have plenty of light. They also included a, a low-pass filter over the sensor, which is, is almost standard. Most digital cameras have this. But some cameras have removed the anti-aliasing filter or they cancel out the effects of the low-pass filter. Cameras like the 5DSR, the Nikon D810, the Nikon D7200. And we see this improved sharpness by 15, 20, 25 percent. So you actually get significantly more detail without having to invest in more expensive lenses. I feel it was a mistake to put a low-pass filter on the 1DX Mark II. Moiré has just it's just isn't often a problem for us. Maybe it is for other people's problem for other people's style of shooting. They also continue to use awful retro LCDs on the top display and the back display. There are far better options available to us that use low power and are visible in bright light, including things like e-ink. OLED displays. This provides not only just nicer looking aesthetically displays, but also reconfigurable displays that can show us exactly the information that we need. This can help productivity and frankly is a bit of, of polish that these cameras at this level should have. As I mentioned earlier, no tilt screen, just a flat screen can make it difficult to record video in different lighting. And no EVF, no focus speaking features we need for video. No Canon log allowing you to capture more dynamic range in the video and no sensor stabilization. As I mentioned before, 20 megapixels means it's going to be a serious compromise for anybody. This isn't the camera for most people. It's for people who are need to push lots of pictures through quickly. Canon 1DX Mark II promises to be an absolutely amazing camera. We've asked Canon for a loaner and we hope to get it soon. We'll have you have a full hands-on review, hopefully against the Nikon D5 just as soon as possible. Subscribe to see that. Also, if you actually want to learn photography, the stuff that really matters, things about technique, storytelling, check out my book, Stunning Digital Photography. Thanks so much. Give us a like. Bye.